you and I have been on a very deliberate and intentional journey over these last seven years together. Seven years. We begin our eighth year together and we continue the work of strengthening and supporting our community through higher quality formation and consistent teaching, through better organization, financial responsibility, and strategic thinking. Seven years on and despite a pandemic, we are accomplishing the goals that our beloved friend Lisa Hempe and the strategic planning team set out to achieve way back in 2017. Now we still have further to go for sure, but sustaining and building on that vision is at the very heart of every strategy decision, every formation program, and every fellowship event. The high quality of programming, service, and fellowship that we have come, become accustomed to must now be the name of the game here. The maintenance and growing of this community with high quality Jesus following must be the name of the game here. This is about quality assurance, if you will. And so to sustain that high level of quality with one priest and now a deacon, thanks be to God. Yeah. But to sustain the high quality with one priest who is indeed responsible for spiritual formation, including teaching and preaching and programs and worship, including Sundays, special holiday services like Christmas and Easter, Wednesday healing services weekly, and wonder on Wednesday nights, as well as the pastoral care and counseling and who also serves as CEO, is simply unsustainable. The quality of the product, if you will, becomes compromised when I am stretched too thin, when I'm not able to maintain healthy margins, including a healthy level of self-care. But this is not just about stretching Father George too thin. This is becoming a systemic issue as it impacts our very bare bones, very part-time paid staff. But not only, as we have returned to church from the pandemic and are now operating on all cylinders, if you will, offering more programs, more depth, more opportunities for growth, those who serve in leadership positions in our parish have begun to fray around the edges. If we look at Sundays alone, for example, it is important to note for each of us that each and every Sunday, this community supports two unique worship services, which includes two sets of Eucharistic ministers, two sets of lectors, two sets of intercessors, ushers, musicians, and two altar guild teams, week in and week out. The commitment to quality of worship at the level we have come to expect requires many moving parts and a high level of participation. And for what we offer, one would expect a deep bench of participation to sustain these services. However, this is not the reality. A small but mighty and dedicated crew of liturgical ministers of all the people that I just mentioned have been working week in and week out to support these two services and the system is simply getting worn thin with folks working some people back-to-back -back Sunday shifts and though happy to help and with love in their hearts they find themselves overworked and overcommitted and burnout is the ugly little secret that churches don't like to talk about. 
simply looking at the issues at hand, sustaining two services, adult Christian formation between the services on Sundays and fellowship on Sundays at the level of the quality to which we have become accustomed will require a deeper bench of volunteers, ministry leaders, and a higher level of participation on all level. This is at the heart of what we will contemplate together over the next three weeks. In a sense, over the next three weeks, what we will wrestle with as a community is actually a sign of our maturity, our growth and our commitment to a healthy and sustainable future for St. Patrick's, which would not be possible unless we had already done good work together, together with God, the work that we've been doing these last seven years. Now, the tricky thing about the reality that we face, the reality of what is absolutely going to be a consequential decision for our community, and one we obviously have been wrestling with in prayerful contemplation and which has been marinated in God's grace, we are contemplating a move to one service, not because we have to, not yet, but because we are committed to moving into the future of our parish in a sustainable way. You may recall that back in January at our annual meeting, we agreed that we would engage in the difficult and uncomfortable realities of modern ministry in this place and in this time now when we have multiple options. Dealing with these issues now, when we have agency in the process, while we still have agency in decision-making, we rejected the path of just continuing to wring our hands in despair or in disbelief or in obstinance, effectively kicking the can down the road when we will have fewer options and little to no agency, which I am sad to report is still, by and large, the current plan of inaction for the church in general. The wolf may not be at the door for us today, but back in December and January, we recognize the truth that if we continue with business as usual, the wolf would arrive within the next two to five years. And that is being optimistic. The reality is the wolf has already arrived for so many of our sister churches, parishes, and missions alike throughout the Episcopal Church and most certainly in the Diocese of Los Angeles, even within our own area. And not just for parishes and churches the size, our size, and smaller. Shrinking interest in organized religious affiliation in the United States generally and aging congregations specifically is the reality for the entire church, Episcopal, Catholic, Evangelical, and otherwise. From historical cardinal parishes with tons of programming and thousands of parishioners slashing their budgets and cutting their staffs in half to missions who have dwindling average Sunday attendance of less than 25 or 30 people shuttering their doors or cutting their services. This reflects the reality we acknowledged back in January at our annual meeting when we decided that as a family in this place, we would take the bull by the horns and lead, lean into that. Trusting God, together with God, we would find a way where there seemed to be no way. What we call God's third way here. We've learned, leaned into that vision by empowering the sustainability team to wrestle on our behalf with how to move forward in a sustainable way so that we not only survive 
62 more years, but so that we thrive in fulfilling our mission of being love-spreading, difference-makers and apprentices of Jesus, whose job it is to transform one heart after another, transforming the world in love. And that's what the sustainability team has been doing since January, meeting and discussing researching, praying, and listening. This is their first recommendation for a sustainable future, with more to come. Remember, the mission of the sustainability team is twofold. First, in the short term, from one annual meeting to another, to discern a way forward to be sustainable in the new year, this first year. And second, to discern the longer game. How will we, we be sustainable for the next 60 years? Already I'm happy to report that this church has stepped up in creating multiple fellowship opportunities through the creation of the fundraising team, which has brought to us our St. Paddy's Day party, the spring tea, and the most recent end of summer jazzy barbecue, which was a huge success. We also have, I am delighted to report, virtually shored up our $73,000 deficit budget we reluctantly passed back in January. And after even a predictable summer slowdown, we are virtually at break even in our predicted revenue for the end of the year. Now that is worth celebrating, St. Patrick's. Now the tricky part I mentioned <laughs> a moment ago is actually that while we contemplate our sustainability, recognizing the truth of what is, we continue to grow. <laughs> That's the delicious irony here. We are growing. Every Sunday it seems to bring new faces, familiar faces that we haven't seen in a while, families, new families, and stories and gifts. So as we continue to grow and add new folks to our family, it is becoming even more clear and imperative that while we only have one priest and a deacon, thanks be to God, we must be more intentional about how we use our resources, both human and financial. This is why the sustainability team and I now bring this issue before this assembled community. We have wrestled with these realities for the last eight months and have come to this fork in the road and now recommend that we consider consolidating into one worship service. Now it is time for us all to wrestle with this decision because we are a family. To wrestle, to share the wrestling together with God. Now these next few weeks will be a process of discernment, continued discernment. We must listen to one another, and we must listen to God. We must seek to understand the issues at hand and be clear-eyed about them. We must listen and understand and respect one another's positions, because if there's something that I know about this community after seven years, y'all are invested, and y'all have an opinion. and I would have it no other way. This is a y'all thing. We must be willing to come with open hearts then and goodwill in this process. We've come too far. And above all, we must find a way to acknowledge that this is not an easy process for anyone. Eight o'clockers or 10 15ers. It has not been easy for the sustainability team and it won't be easy for me or for you. Because while you may be excited about this prospect, and there is a lot to be excited about, 
I guarantee that there are those in our community who are afraid of this potential change. And they will hurt. And they will grieve. And that is real. But we are all in this together. And in this case, we are our brother and sister's keepers. And so these next few weeks will be a process also of reconciliation. We must be pastoral and compassionate towards those for whom even the prospect of wrestling with this decision is painful and disruptive. We must engage in reconciling the current realities of the church temporal with its shrinking attendance and dwindling influence in the world, with the timeless and cosmic reality of the God of love who is the ground of all being and who has called this church, I am clear, into being and given us our marching orders to love and serve and heal and whole make in the name of love. We must pay close attention to one another's pain, anger, grief, or fear. And we must continue to care for one another, loving one another, as we have first been loved. This must be a process of rejoicing in hope, being patient in suffering, and persevering in prayer, to paraphrase Paul's letter to the Roman church today. And this process is not unfamiliar to us. We do pretty well with change here. So here we go. Here's the proposal. None of this means that we don't love our traditions, by the way. It doesn't mean that we're throwing a baby out with the bathwater. It doesn't mean that we aren't satisfied with our expression of worship here at St. Patrick's. As a matter of fact, I think we love our worship here at St. Patrick's. But we also know that the world is changing. The ground beneath us is shifting. The proposal, this proposal, is not about watering down the message. I guarantee you that. It is not about seeking the path of least resistance or the convenient road. But we know that God's promise to us is that when we seek God's path, when we engage in the kingdom life, God's promise is not that we will be comfortable. It has never been a life full of hammocks and soft beds, but walking shoes and walking sticks. The promise is not a path that will be convenient or easy or even familiar. The promise is God will be with us and that we will be a new creature, y'all, that we will be a new creation with new life. That's what we seek in this sustainability project. New life, new possibility, new hope. Now, the temptation for us human beings is to want to speed through the hard stuff, right? Get to the other side. Rip off the Band-Aid and move on. Well, God's way is always to slow down to speed up. This is true throughout Scripture for Abraham and David and Moses and Elijah standing at the back of the cave and Jesus, and Paul, and now St. Patrick's. We have a saying in our home, Karen and I, (laughs) if there's weight, then wait. If there's weight, then wait. And there's weight. So we wait together. So for the next three weeks, we will continue worshiping and extend our combined service at 9.30 through kickoff Sunday. Now, kickoff Sunday is when we introduce all of our new ministries, all of our old ministries, all of our continuing ministries, and we celebrate, and we always do that together in one service. So there's no reason to start and stop and start and stop. During that time, we will engage in prayerful conversation as a family. We will listen to one another at two town hall style meetings before and after the services on September 10th and 17th at 8.30 a.m., which will be the restart of our adult Christian formation. And after the service, 
we will also meet. I will make myself available and the team will make themselves available during fellowship in the parish hall. The goal here is to come to some understanding and consensus on how we move forward by the 24th. This is the proposal for our consideration, so please listen carefully. And it will be posted on our website and on our Facebook page and in our Thursday MailChimp newsletter. The proposal. That we move to one combined 930 service permanently with godly play. The first Sunday of every month will be a right one instructed Eucharist so that the whole congregation, including the traditionally 1015ers, can deepen their understanding of the liturgical theology and understand and appreciate the beauty of that right one service. Adult Christian formation will happen from 8.30 until 9.15. At 9.10, this church space will be designated a quiet, meditative space for contemplation, preparation for worship, and prayer. There will be coffee and refreshments outside the church with umbrellas when it's hot and maybe heat lamps when it's cold outside the church here to support before church fellowship, which both services enjoy. But when we enter the church as a spiritual discipline that we will, as a family, take on, quiet will be observed. This allows for also a more dynamic liturgy going from silence and contemplation to sending us out with the dismissal, hallelujah, hallelujah, out to the world to transform hearts, minds, and lives. Fellowship as usual will always happen after the service in the parish hall. And so, my friends, I invite your prayers, your discernment, and your contemplation. To conclude, I offer this prayer for beginnings and endings by Kate Bowler and Jessica Ritchie from their book, The Lives We Actually Live, 101 Blessings for Imperfect Days. I am overjoyed to say that this comes to us from our administer and our sister in faith, Jen Corbett. For beginnings and endings, let us pray. This life is made up of so many beginnings and so many endings. We start new jobs and leave old ones. We move to new cities and leave our childhood hobbies in our parents' basement. We become new people slowly, hopefully kinder and funnier. Friends and relationships come and go. Dreams blossom and then they wither. And we find ourselves here once again at the precipice of change, afraid to let go and afraid of what will happen if we don't. Might this be a place of blessing too? Blessed are we, standing in the hallway, between closed doors and the ones still to come, between the old and the new, between the worn in and the doesn't quite yet fit, between who we were and who we might become. God, make it remotely possible to grow and change, become open to new adventures and untethered to routine or to the same old. Because the anxiety rising in my shoulders and filling my throat tells me that I am unlikely, unwilling to step, step forward. Blessed are we who take a minute to look over our shoulder at all we learned from what was the people we became, the people who loved us into becoming, the peace that came with familiarity. Blessed are we who trust this timing and who open our hearts anew to change, to new friends, to hope. Nervous, maybe heavy-hearted, 
but brimming with gratitude for a life so beautiful that it hurts to say goodbye. Blessed are we, turning our eyes ahead toward a new path not yet mapped. God, give us courage to take this next step, and enough for the one after that too. Remind us that you have gone before and behind and around and are with us now in our leaving, in our arriving, in our changes expected or shocking. Surprise us with who we might become. Amen.